I sometimes forget. Okay, we've been waiting for this one. I've been waiting for this one. This one's gonna be a little bit more interactive than some of the other ones, so I'm really excited about that. Um, Dr. G here, as always, I start all of these off with just having a couple of minutes, uh, 60 seconds to be exact, uh, to just arrive here from whatever you came from to wherever you're going. And uh, I'm excited to share this space with you guys today. So feel free if you'd like, put yourself off camera, whatever you need to do just to take 60 seconds arrive here you'll hear a bell when it is over and i will see you all in just a few so And there we go. Welcome back to the space. I hope that that served as just a quick breather to uh, get you here tonight. So thank you for joining as always. It's so good to see everybody. I think at one point I even saw Chris in the background. Hi, Chris. Um, it's so good to see everybody. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good morning. Good evening. Good evening. Good afternoon. Everybody's joining from all over the country, which is just so cool. I love it. Um, this is awesome. So I have Mr. Marcus with us tonight and, um, I just want to briefly kind of set the stage for him of how I found him. I was on LinkedIn and I remember finding some sort of post about, psycho spirituality and i thought mm, i like the sound of that so uh as you all know i'm super interested in um good morning from india you see this is right it's very cool uh so um as you all know i'm super interested in emotional intelligence and that goes much further than ux research and ux design and things like that and it goes into designing your own life so I was immediately um, interested and intrigued in what Marcus was doing. And then I saw that he wrote a book and I was like, okay, he wrote a book. So then I looked a little bit further into dig deep. And then I saw this five by five method and I was like, oh, what is this? And I saw all of the five Fs that I like, friends, faith, family, fitness, and finances finances <laughs> <laughs> so I might, I might not particularly like finances but uh, you got to deal with them anyways so right. i was like all right i like all of these five f's these are good so when we just started having a conversation and sooner probably than he had imagined i was like hey you want to be on my show and he yeah. was like wait what and i was like yeah come on come on through so this is how we got to where we are today so um marcus is gonna walk us through one one piece like the book is great and he's gracefully extended and uh a cool little promotion for you guys just for coming to the webinar which is awesome but um i'm going to drop in that pdf again just for some folks who've just joined um he's going to take us through like a small portion of the book i have personally read the book and i am going back through it again a second time because there's a lot of gems in there everybody has one of those books where you go through it two and three times this is definitely one of them um, what I can say about the book is that the content of it is something that you have not that you've heard before. You've heard this content before, right? Marcus isn't coming at you from a different point of view or bringing anything like brand spanking new. 
Well, what he does is he takes it out of the the thinking space and actually gives you like things to think about. Like every time you're reading a paragraph, it says like focus point and like it's in italics. So you're like, all right, this I need to focus on. So you're taken out of this whole like personal reflection and, and this journey and you're brought right back to reality, right back to today, which I think is different than a lot of books do. A lot of books will keep me in the future and keep mm -hmm. me thinking about, oh, who I want to be and what I want to do. Um, mm -hmm. But as we all know, in order to make a change, you have to accept where you are at this moment. And I think that Marcus does a really beautiful job at doing that. So I'm I'm just thrilled that you're here. Thank you, Marcus, very much. I'm going to drop the PDF in there, and then I'm going to stand back and be quiet and let Marcus run the show. So thank you, and uh, I'll drop the PDF. It's all you. All right. Well, well, thank you very much. I, I couldn't have uh, prepared a, a better introduction. And just like uh, Bree said, it was just like, hey, Marcus, where you at? Um, but I'm going to tell you where you're going to be. Uh, so <laughs> um, appreciate the space. And uh, again, um, my uh, the best thing that I can do is just kind of say what brought me to the space. And it was uh, Chaplain Seals, a long uh, history of uh, uh, military service. I am a retired Army Captain Chaplain. I did start en enlisted um, to state my age. I am uh, 41 years old. Um, and I, I throw off my high schoolers because they like, hey, uh, you know, um, are you uh, like 28? I'm like, uh, I might act like it, but you know, throw, throw a few extra years in there. So, um, and, and with that, I'm, I'm very much um, centered around everything here. None of this was, um, should I say, uh, inserted, um, uh, by happenstance, it's very methodical, and I'm going to break that down for everyone. And so um, I want to invite everybody into an authentic space by playing a little uh, game. Um, and this game, if, if we're going to really befriend our, ourselves, um, and we're going to travel through these chapters, and the chapter, uh, especially when we get to chapter three, is going to be engaging fear. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer, and and I'll 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 be the one to just step on a stage, but it's not about me. I want someone to just think, and if you want to use the chats, that's fine. And IG use the chats too. What's your favorite curse word? <laughs> what is your favorite curse word, right? And by all means, share it. I'm excited to hear ones in other languages too, because I know we have That's at beautiful. least three people that speak a different language, at least. I'm having so much resistance. Like I don't want to admit it or say it out loud. Oh. All right. And then we travel backwards and say, who told us that we couldn't say it and why? And then we ask ourselves, why does that make us feel a particular way? And why can we say it when we're by ourselves, but not in front of certain people or at certain times, right? And what does it mean to me versus them, right? And then we start digging deep. You see? I so y'all, you're in for a treat. When we do exercises like this and we bring ourselves into the present and then quickly travel to the past, mentally, emotionally, and we bring that past into the present, we are integrating a portion of our past selves into the present. And then we are um, not only analyzing, but that piece of self-reflection uh, and we're questioning that piece of deep questioning. I wear this hat for a reason because it's a part of me. I'm wearing this uh, dashiki shirt. It's my favorite shirt. And then I asked myself, well, I, I want to wear my favorite shirt. And I was looking at all the button downs and everything else. And I'm like, eh, that really doesn't represent me. That doesn't say who I am or who I want to be. Well, people are going to ask questions. Of course, they're going to ask questions. But if they don't ask me those questions, I don't know what the fuck those questions are. Right? I'm not a mind reader. So if we are going to be in our authentic selves, 
then we have to present ourselves as we are. Hence, the five by five, five by side method in God. Just gonna ask uh, everyone a favor. Uh, if you have any uh, actions that you're engaging in, um, could you mute your microphone, please? So with that in mind, the opening chapter, the first chapter says, um, and I know this verbatim because I wrote it, some of the stuff I don't, because <laughs> it came to me on uh, an um, inspirational whim. Why wait for someone to see you when you look into your own eyes daily? Right? Now, speaking of this, there was someone that I was supporting. I, I support many people. I support myself. The idea behind this is we travel and we go to different places and spaces. We try to garner attention. We see it the most in children, but as adults, we do it also. We wave, we interact. We want someone to acknowledge us. We try so hard to do it. And yet we have the ability to acknowledge ourselves at every waking moment, at every point and every time for the entirety of our lives. And yet we don't. Hmm. How fulfilled could we be if we just attempted to do that for a percentage of our day. Acknowledging that not only are we present or being, but that we are magnificent, that the heartbeat within itself is doing it without our conscious ability. That's a magnificent piece of life. Yeah, we can do all this and we can, you know, defend, we can talk, we can project, we can do great things when we put our thoughts into fashion and form, but there are things that are happening outside of our conscious, right? Our consciousness that we contain and we are a part of. And that is magnificent. And yet, we go day by day, moment by moment, unacknowledging. And we're waiting for someone to say, I see that in you. And yet, in our relationships, when that doesn't happen, we feel without. We feel unfulfilled. And we feel as though um, life is without meaning. And this is the process of digging deep. And why I open the book up with that statement. And so then there is this, I, I won't read too much from it, but most importantly, focus moment, right? The focus moment states, who convinced you that your life is not worth living, that happiness is not to be had by you, that happiness seems so impossible or out of your reach? If you're honest, you have convinced yourself of these false perceptions. You have owned these falsehoods, which you have initially heard from other sources, whether they be family, friends, uh, uh, passerby, commercials, or something else. The point that I'm making is sometimes our thoughts, and we'll get into this in chapter two, aren't ours. They're reiterations of things that we've heard in the past, perceptions of ourselves that we've owned, and projections of ideas that, whether it be a societal view or an interaction, or even uh, a false reality or misconception of a historical reference that is in fact not true. 
that we placate and play out. And then we are made to feel as though in our daily living, our daily lives, the emotional attachment is, should I say, lackluster, right? But yet and still, when we compare it, which is why we have the parent, we have the individual um, that says, well, you know, children in Africa are starving. <laughs> well, number one, that every child in Africa or anywhere throughout the world is starving. And there's some charging, uh, excuse me, there's some uh, <laughs> children here that are starving as well. In fact, there were some of us that were starving when we were younger. But it's that reference point that we go back to. So if we can understand these reference points, we can give them to ourselves. So our lives, this is what the five by five side by side guide really brings us to focus upon. So that favorite curse word there, anyone willing? Nah, I'm just messing with y'all. <laughs> I was like, I'm ready. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck it. <laughs> Here's the interesting thing, though, is that I grew up like hearing cuss words, but it wasn't that big of a deal. Mm -hmm. But now that I have children, I actually don't cuss. And so my favorite cuss word to say is like patooties. <laughs> and that doesn't mean anything to anybody, right? But what it does is it makes people feel like either people feel like, oh, that's so funny and that's lies and you feel more comfortable or you feel even more awkward than if I said a cuss word because it's just like, what is a grown woman doing saying patooties? Saying patooties, right? But, but again, but it has meaning to you. So it's yeah. not a judgment call, right? It is uh, who we are. And if that's what you're going to stand by, then you're judging yourself in that space. Mm. And this is what we have to come to understand. Self-judgment. Not judgment from the parent. Not judgment from the creator. Not judgment from the society that we are developed in. Self-judgment because we don't know any of those thoughts, ideas, perceptions, which is why chapter two is perception versus reality. So I'm gonna to have to share my screen now. Where, where are we going here? All right. I'm going to move forward. Uh, I have to give you guys the, the whole, well, I'll give you the table of contents instead of just going through everything. All right. Perception versus reality in your mental universe. So a portion of this, and, and when I get real excited, I start yelling. I apologize. Like, <laughs> uh, it, it's from my years as a as an army this and an army that and they they call it sounding off and it's just making sure that you know everybody hears you type of deal perception versus reality what we feel is real right so if something hits us yeah we feel that pain however we always question our emotions we question our mental faculties and we question um, the intangible, which is why our faith becomes so difficult to, um, should I say, understand or even uh, to travel along and hold, if you will, true in fashion and form. We'll get to that some other time, right? That's why chapter seven goes into uh, your five by five, side by side uh, process. 
perception versus reality is this um, is the uh, psychology portion of the book because it reveals more or less that regardless of what we think about the world, what we think about others, or even what we perceive about ourselves, reality is still going to be reality. You see, that is just the matter of fact portion of things. Now, how we warp our perception is how we cope with these portions of reality. Meaning, if we're going to boil this down, now I'm not talking about scientific theory, okay? I'm not talking about how a philosophy works, I'm talking about some shit until it doesn't matter anymore, okay? What I'm talking about simply is how we can function in a space and be present, authentic, honest with ourselves, okay? So if we're going to be honest and truthful and factual, then we have to accept certain things, right? This portion of acceptance is who we are, how we were raised, our relationships. We sometimes don't know our parents well enough to understand what they've imparted upon us. We don't know the interactions that we have engaged in that have caused our um, trauma responses even, right? We hardly even know how to define trauma, let alone being able to describe if we've been traumatized, <laughs> right? Um, and I'm speaking from experience because when we're, uh, um, uh, let's put it this way, the development of the human brain, uh, anatomy and physiology, it states that it takes somewhere around 25 years for the, for the brain to be completely um, developed. Now, you know, I'm not an MD and I don't claim to be, I'm just a dude that knows a lot of shit and says, what he doesn't know and I'm okay with what I don't know, okay? So 25 years old, but yet and still we tell someone that legally they're an adult at the age of 18. Well, they can do some shit um, at 18 years old, but legally they're um, able to drink and do some other shit at the age of 21, right? Um, but yet and still uh, you have an, a higher insurance premium until you're the age of 25 and uh, you can't rent a car without um, a co-signer or another adult's um, signature until you're 25. Why is that? Anybody ask? Most of us don't ask, but we still kind of wonder like, hey, I'm not feeling too adultish. I have a question well, before I actually answer it though, before you answer it. Yes, yes, I'm yes. curious about the people who live in other countries. Is that true for you all too? Like, do you like, That's a good have, question. like, I know that like in Europe, there might not be a drinking age and things like that. But like, for people who are like, I know that some of you have India and Indonesia, like, is that is that accurate for you guys too? Mm, yes, in Indonesia, we have to reach like, um, until we 17. So we can drink. Okay. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Yeah. Okay. 
and then okay so so it is all right in india too okay just i just want to do a quick culture check all right thank you thank go you. ahead mark it's my bad because we must be culturally responsive right and not just speak from a western lens or uh should i say a, a gender specific or regionally uh specific um thank you Mm -hmm, mm hmm. Good point. John also brought up in the chat that uh, in, it differs over states, even within the United States, of what drinking age and consent is. So, OK, carry on. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, no, no. Don't be sorry at all. And, and anytime you need to intervene and say, hey, Marcus, you're wrong. <laughs> you better okay. not be wrong. I'm, probably, I'm just kidding. I, I can be wrong <laughs> because it's a whole lot of shit that I ain't even experienced before. I'm still trying to get in the space. Amen. It's some, it's some stuff out there, like Space Force. <laughs> Excuse me. All right. I'm here, I'm here to learn from you, Marcus. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, John. Okay, so with these in mind, and, and mind you, my um, expertise as I'm speaking uh, from this is being a licensed insurance producer, right? And also studying my uh, Series 6 um, securities uh, and whatnot. Okay. So um, there's a reason why I put finance in there. And it's not just because, you know, at one time I had bad credit and I knew how to repair it. <laughs> now that is true, <laughs> but that's not the only reason. All right. So point is the human brain takes time to develop and grow. And at times they base uh, laws upon risk upon uh, risk management and mitigation and all this other stuff, right? Especially when it comes down to other people's property, okay? Or corporations and things of that sort. Now, if it was solely based upon uh, whether they felt you were capable of just simply driving, then everybody would be able to have their driver's license at the age of um, mm -hmm. just simply 16 and be fully insured with a lower premium uh, at that age as well, right? As well as boys or young men um, having the same insurance premium as females, but yet ours is always higher. Why? Because there are differences between the way the human male brain is uh, grown, formed, structured, hormones, all that other stuff, and they calculate that in. Well, hmm, I can't speak for the whole industry, but that's just the shit that I know, okay? Point that I'm making is, when it boils down to it, this is what's real. And we have to go off of some of this information when it comes down to even our perception of things. So perception versus reality. How was our parents' development interrupted or not when we were being raised? Hmm. Some of us don't no, and neither do our parents, <laughs> right? Even when it comes down to uh, trauma and how they reacted to us during periods of reactivity, right? And response, if you're talking about family violence, if you're talking about uh, community violence, Take 911, for instance, and I'm not going to go too far into this because we're going to segue. 911, they broadcasted it around the world. So it didn't just affect New York City. Mm -hmm. Everyone was afraid to fly, everyone was traumatized, and everyone was afraid of the terrorist threat. And what in ethnicity and appearance, it might look like. Mm -hmm. So when you have a dominant media outlet that can 
propose particular projections, then we have to ask who controls perception? I'm just proposing a question. And then we go into reality. We have to stay in the tangible present of who we are and who we desire to be, which is why there is a planning portion in the book. I want to stop you real quick, Marcus, because yes. you brought up something that has been actually in my current conversations in life about 9-11, uh, mainly, and, and now I'm, I'm able to put this perception versus reality piece to that. And so it's giving me some legs to this, mm -hmm. what could be quite um, of, a, of a superfluous idea, but the perception of all of that, for me, at least growing up, um, and this wasn't brought on by my family, but brought on by by culture and society. And I think that it's still carrying out in some subcultures of the United States is that the Muslim religion hates America. Mm. And mm. that I still think, I still believe that there are Muslims that are still trying to correct, course correct that. And I could be totally off, right? But I still am hearing things come up, which is that perception, this potentially inaccurate reference point. Absolutely. Which is that Muslims hate Americans. And the the versus part, which is what you're saying is like a, a mode of acceptance. The only way that you can get from perception to reality is this mode of acceptance. But this planning piece that you're about to talk about, which I think is going to get into into this acceptance a little bit more, is that you actually have to educate yourself you on the Muslim religion, number one. And two, if you believe that America was founded in Christianity, which we can debate that at a later time, if that mm -hmm. is the case, then you need to also look at um, God in the Quran, right? And so I love that you're bringing this up because it helps me think and plan about, okay, how am I going to go from this inaccurate reference point to accepting that obviously Muslims do not hate Americans? And how am I going to plan for that so that I can be rooted in reality? And so I know that this has nothing to do with befriending myself, but it has to do with helping my, my, the people in my life befriend Muslims. And so but I just a, put that out there. There's a faith aspect, right? Yes. So there, there's so <clears throat> there's so much, and that's why this book, <laughs> as as boiled down as it is, it covers the spectrum of the human condition. Welcome. And so I can't say at all that what you're bringing forward has nothing to do with befriending yourself. Amen. Okay. Fair. Right. Um, so um, I'm affirming what it is that you are bringing forward and validating that because there is a piece here uh, in the five by five uh, guide uh, that speaks of faith, all right? Um, and as touchy as that is, because they say, don't talk about sex, politics, and religion. Um, <laughs> that's like, damn, I, I guess we can't even talk about this damn. <laughs> we just gonna <laughs> stare at each other like this. Right, right, make everybody uncomfortable, straight elevator style. Anyway. Um, what <laughs> um, you bring forward is this piece of, uh, let, let's talk about that. Let's talk about uh, faith. Let's talk about um, that particular dynamic um, because, and, and I, I don't wanna uh, make it seem as though we're jumping ahead because there really isn't any jump. This is a fluid conversation. Mm -hmm. um, I was raised in an Islamic household Mm -hmm. Right. That's number one. Um, and number two, um, I was raised not entirely understanding my religion. I am now a, faci a facilitator of individuals, religious rights and spirituality. And I also um, support uh everyone's right to choose their path as it relates to um how they integrate 
um, and identify with the divine, right? So when it comes down to uh, what you spoke on, how does one person, right, um, who occupies a very finite space define for another who occupies a very finite space, um, determine the vastness of anything outside of ourselves for another. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? So based upon that question alone, whether we go into any type of religious book or doctrine or scripture or whatever the case may be, one person cannot, nor even humanity in itself cannot hold all of the answers for humanity itself. If that is the case, then humanity must come together for humanity's sake. If you understand what I'm saying. Okay. Only then will we be able to, um, should I say, put this conundrum back into a healthy, um, uh, should I say, trajectory and allow for the healing of the past to reflect the future that we are really working towards. But remember, not everyone is working for that future, which is why the past looks the way that it does, right? Which is again, why at the end of the book, it is this process of focusing on posterity, on future generations. Right, because if we are um, simply um, in it for ourselves, um, looking for the next best thing, then the moment will always pass and the future um, for those that matter the most will continue to uh, be in a declining, it will continue to look the way that it does right now. Mm -hmm. Or some will believe that there is no hope where the reality is there's nothing but hope. But again, the research that you describe needs to be done. Some just don't know where we're at in this day and time. What I mean by that is not to take it into this revelatory, oh, prophetic, you know, um, I never met Jesus or Muhammad or the Buddha, Siddhartha, Zarathustra, Tut Ankh Amun, or in any of the greats. <laughs> I just heard about them. All right. <laughs> All right. I read about them. I mean, hell, I might even become a great because my name is in a book and shit. There you go. <laughs> but um the point that i'm making is this uh with all of the cultures and the diversification of the world what we don't recognize is that the greatness of the diversity and the synchronicity of the message has always been on the one. So that's what I want to say about that faith portion without dialoguing so much into um, how difficult it is to live in a, should I say, single mindset and dominated um, culture, westernized culture, let's put it that way. Um, Cycles of trauma and drama. No, correction. Engaging fear, grief, guilt, shame, and blame. Dr. G, how did you do with this one? All right, this one was probably one of the hardest chapters, not because of the fear part. Um, when you engage grief, for me, because it is, it's always close enough but compartmentalized enough for me to be able to go about my day and do the things I do. So it's like a faucet, but a leaky one. So when I engage it, like sometimes 
I'm like, I know the handles there and I'll be able to turn it off, but I, ca I cannot turn it off. And it freaks me out. I don't know if there's anybody else on this webinar who has had this moment where you're like, I really want to cry, but you're just like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to turn it off when I start. Mm -hmm. So I had that mm -hmm. moment of just like, if I engage in grief right now, like it is, I, no, not right now. And so I actually put this chapter right. off the first time around. Mm -hmm because I didn't want to engage in all of it, not because of the feelings or anything, but just because I was worried that I was going to be able to disengage. Does, yeah. does that make sense? Okay. That makes a whole lot of sense. And okay. if anybody else has um, uh, some ideas behind that, please share. Um, I, uh, it took me a moment to finish writing this chapter um, because of not particularly the, unfinished uh grief work but the finished grief work just saying wow got to go through this again got to revisit these instances got to revisit these stories and that's why as uh i'm if i'm hearing you right it's difficult to um uh uncap that bottle <laughs> mm -hmm. because it is it's like a champagne bottle and nobody knows how to put the cork back in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And 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 one of the things that I was reading this, because the first time I read it, I read it for myself. And now the second time I'm reading it through is like, um, I don't know if anybody on this call is, is like a UX researcher or a UX designer, but I start to think about it for the people who I'm designing or, or, or researching. And um, you always research or you always design at least to unpack joy, right? Like to bring moments of joy. And on the opposite of joy, there are op opportunities to, like you said, design for fear or grief or guilt or shame or blame. And especially when you're doing like an app about like weight loss or something like that, all of those will come in at some point. Or if you're doing an app about, um, you know, being for, for single parents, again, right all of those come in and so i just i started thinking as i was reading this the second time around i was like i don't have to read this for myself this is a great chapter love this chapter but when you're reading about it for other people you start to to also not want to tip your toe in it which i thought was so fascinating was that it was like not only was this about like i couldn't do it for myself but i, I had a hard time being like oh my gosh what is the fear of a mom who just entered single parenthood because the father of her child is now incarcerated. Like, what is that fear like? Like, who's gonna pick up my baby? When is the next time you're just gonna see your dad? And so I just started to think about all of that for the other person. And it was still difficult to to be to say, like, all right, I'm gonna be able to cork this at some point. So I just wanna say that that it it is not an easy chapter. So this is not an easy topic. Um, but yes, I, and enjoy I, your I, dinner, Angie. Thank right, you for right, right. I, I, yeah, and and for some, <laughs> for some um, uh, who I've uh, reviewed with, right, it was almost like, um, and excuse my English, right, I might offend some folks, but just let me say it. It's like, nigga, why you write this book? Um, yeah. But with that, <laughs> it's like because it had to be written. Yeah. Because there's so much avoidance with all of these things. Um, and what it boils down to is fear. If we understand the fight, flight, freeze uh, responses with relation to fear, avoidance is one of those um, freeze moments or flight correction moments. If we're in that flight mode, like, I don't want to do this, we need to name that as fear, right? So if we're afraid to pop that cork, then it's like, oh, I'm afraid. And then we have to ask ourselves, why am I afraid? Um, so there was a portion here with, uh, I wanted to bring it up on, um, let me boil it down. <clears throat> Fear. Fear is a natural response. We're supposed to be afraid of things. And the reason why we're supposed to be afraid of things is that um, it keeps us alive. Um, it also allows for the adrenaline to pump and 
we can defend ourselves, right? Um, too much fear at any one uh, point in time uh, sends us into um, a overproduction of these hormones, right? And Dr. G, because I haven't finished uh, my doctorate and everything else, I'm not the expert, okay? So if you need to cut in there and be like, hey, brother, let me step in here because I got better words. Go ahead and do that. No, you're good. I did, I did drop in there for those of you who are able to check the chat. I did drop in a little piece about uh, the fawn response, which is added now to the fight, fight, flight, freeze. So it's like fight, flight, freeze, or fawn, which is that instinctual response uh, to avoid trauma. Thank so, you. You're Thank welcome. You. Yeah. Because uh, I'm, I'm about to write that down in my personal copy right here. I'm like, there you go. here comes uh, edition number two. There it is. <laughs> um, and so with that, um, in this piece of avoidance, um, if we're just simply able to name uh, what we're afraid of, then we can um, rationalize our fear. Now, if we're in a state of reactive trauma, then that's totally different, right? Because sometimes trauma will have us or trauma response based upon uh, the particular trauma. And if it is a, um, not to um, pathologize ourselves, if we have like PTSD or, or if we've been severely traumatized, I'm not talking about the severe trauma, okay? Say for instance, you get into a car accident. A severe car accident might cause for you to be a little hesitant to drive it again, okay? So for instance, so in this particular state of fear, we um, use, we can use our hormones and we can use this reactivity and we can use this state of, um, should I say awareness to our advantage. However, if you are in a state of unconscious awareness, then you're just all over the damn place, okay? Now, the best of those, if you're gonna, the, if I'm gonna put this into a, a militaristic type of uh, science, right? We're talking about tier one operators. If you're gonna focus that, then we're talking about precision shots. We're talking about precision movement. We're talking about being able to, uh, and not even just that, if we're talking about a master martial artist, if we're talking about um, someone who is used to being in a chaotic environment. I have found that for me and those like myself, I can function in a chaotic environment. It's the after effect that messes me up. Like, oh my God, I need to decompress because all of that chaos has now caught up to me and I, it's ruminating, it's going around. I got to get it out of my head. I need to calm it down. The adrenaline um, isn't slowing down. I need some support with that, okay? And so then the trauma responses pick up again. And we have to be aware of these things, right? This is why first responders have uh, difficulty. Um, and again, uh, not to go too far into it, but if we are fearful, if we know how to harness uh, that technique, then not only can we navigate through those situations, we can navigate around them. I'm a hell of a driver. I don't. I don't get into car accidents. Now my shit got stolen a few months ago because my daughter dropped the key fob. That wasn't me. My other car got drowned in a pool of water a few years ago. That was my mom. <laughs> I've gotten rear-ended. Not me. Have I spun out? A little bit. However, I have certain abilities. So let's go into yours. What are you a genius at? Are you aware? Have you been able to become so aware that you can name it? 
the you portion of the creator that pumps your heart and feeds your soul that is that unconscious portion of yourself that you can become aware of at any given moment. Ooh, do we get to open up the floor? Will people actually say like what you're a genius at? Because I am Absolutely. so curious. Absolutely. Oh, I love it. Okay, not all at once, everybody. Come on, come on. Uh, can I try? Yes, <laughs> get it, CT. I think I'm genius at um, expressing myself through like uh, writing poems or songs. Sometimes I write through piano. Sometimes I draw. Yeah, that that's actually my way of understanding myself because I don't really quite uh, understand the dynamic inside me. So I express through art. <laughs> oh, I love it. I love beautiful. it. That is beautiful. Oh. <laughs> Thank you. That is so cool. See, See you too. I love hearing that. Now, CT, <clears throat> um, when you get into your art form, how do you do it? What's that process? How do you focus? Mm, actually, I tend to visualize things like for example if I long for somebody I see I saw a moon and me as a bird <laughs> trying to fly up to the moon Ooh. and then yeah and then um, uh, I always visualize with uh, nature like the wind so and the and the uh, howling voices calling my name maybe the the graveyard, uh, all, all about symbols. Uh, that's why it becomes an art like drawings, illustrations, poems, right? It's, it's easier for me. Mm -hmm. Yes. And I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, Dr. G, did you want to chime in? For me, uh, I am a lover of cultures. And so when I'm in the room with other cultures, that is what makes me at peace that I'm so that I can be curious about other cultures. I don't feel like, gosh, I feel uncomfortable or like I don't know them and I don't know what they're about. And like, that's like the biggest thing. And I feel like it's helped me navigate a lot of shame and blame around being American and living in a first world country and having all of these, um, What's the word I'm looking for? I have all of these like standards that I have dropped over the years because uh, I've been more curious about other cultures and I wanna learn more about other cultures. And so I feel like that is my, that's my special power is to just, just be with, be just, I love learning about cultures. I love languages. I love hearing like, like right now I'm like, I wonder what music CT listens to. Right, like I'm like so curious and I know that like, I'm now like I have like a, a common tab which like puts me uh, from Pacific time into Indian standard time. So I know like what time it is in India. And I'm like, I wonder, I look at the weather. I'm like the weather right now, what is the weather like in South India right now? And I'm just so curious what other people are experiencing. Um, and that has helped me a lot engage and then disengage in a healthy way with that shame and blame. I love that um, because what I'm hearing is uh, different methods to tap into uh, a creative source, right? Yeah. And I'm most uh, curious um, about how we all do it and how we can continue to help others um, see that within themselves. On my screen share, I've got page nine up. Um, and anytime you guys want to read it, but I'm going to summarize this, this focus moment, this ability to ask yourself, who am I? We are so multifaceted that we exist. <clears throat> and excuse me, I, I actually 
uh, came down with um, something that I didn't want, which was some head congestion. Anyways, um, so you might hear me clearing my throat a bit. We can be so aware of the many portions of ourselves at any given time, but I just want to um, help us focus on three portions. The I, the you, the me, which makes we. Other than simply understanding that you are a physical, liquid, gas, entity, <laughs> all at once. How do we know this? Because you're breathing air, right? Nitrogen and the oxide and all that stuff. You have different forms of liquid going through you at every given moment, right? Obviously you're solid because if you weren't, eh, then you wouldn't be. And then you have a mental portion of yourself that's interacting. Do we think about this or are we just going about the daily motions? So in my book, I said, you existed as a consciousness, even as a sperm, which was ejected from your father and raised purposefully faster, stronger, and more determined than hundreds of millions of others to survive, thrive, and grow. This survival, this need to thrive and grow is a primal energy that still exists within you. Thus, think how comical it is and worth mentioning how many in our spiteful adolescence muttered to themselves, I never asked to be born. How very true this statement is because you did not ask to be born, you demanded it. And yet and still, every day, we are walking, moving portions of energy going towards unconscious purpose until we bring purpose into our consciousness. Mm -hmm. And then when you bring purpose into your consciousness, persistent perseverance, and you cannot be stopped but you have to reiterate that. Some people find purpose in many different things. So what I'm describing to you is this process of being able to not only go to your childhood, but go into the moment prior to your physical existence and tap into your purpose. Like, shit, I can do this mentally. Like, man, there is power in me. Aside from just simply, okay, I can make it comical, <laughs> but I'm not going to make it too. Like, man, I was in my father. I was in my mother. I was in everyone prior to that. And if we go back far enough, how far back are we actually going? To the Big Bang? To the center of the universe? To when we were all together all at once? For some, it's unimaginable. Mm -hmm. But to others, well, damn. Now I can think of anything. And then I can become what I want. So, so I'm one of those uh, unimaginable people, right? Like I'm the I'm the person here who's like, I can only go far back enough to be like, okay, I was part of my mom, but I can't go any further back. Um, and so wh while I, at times it doesn't really necessarily limit my thinking, mm -hmm. I think what it does do is it makes it be like, I don't know what my purpose was all the way back then. And I can't dig any deeper to just like, what, what I thought my purpose was when was I, when I was in high school. Or sometimes, honestly, to be really transparent, I can't even really figure out what my purpose was before my kids. 
And I don't know if anybody else is like struggling with that, like oh, before you had this job or before you started this organization and or before you like were a parent, like what exactly was your purpose? And so what, I, what I'm finding that happens is as you say to bring your purpose into consciousness, I feel like it's like a fade in, fade out. You know, like when you're at the eye mm -hmm. doctors and he's like, which one's better, number one, number two. Mm -hmm. I feel like that happens a lot with me because right now, like, ooh, it's so clear. But mm -hmm. I guarantee around Christmas time and New Year's, all this stuff is going to flood and be like, do you know who you are? Are you ready for the next year? Do you have goals right, set? Right. All that stuff's going to come flooding into me. And, and then my purpose is going to go whoop, and it's going to get all blurry. And then I'm going to be, oh no, I need to mm -hmm. figure it out. And then it's going to come back into consciousness again, but it'll be a most likely a different purpose. Like, is that, I'm, I'm looking at you, Marcus, normal. is that normal? Is that normal? <laughs> oh, am, am I a normal <laughs> human in this? damn condition and everybody doing this shit or Thank am I you. <laughs> multifaceted and I, I I like to drink juice and water on different days and times and shit right <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would say sometimes you like juice Pepsi um damn coke uh water uh shit Gatorade <laughs> Tang. I'd like Tang. I do like Tang. Still. Tang? Yes. You know, you, you might even be one of those high fructose lovers. <laughs> but you do feel like, right? Like it is. Absolutely. I do believe. Yeah. Go ahead, John. Tang is uh, what astronauts drink. See? Maybe tang that's is what astronauts drink. Yeah, that's why I probably like it because I'm I'm harnessing my inner astronaut. I did I did love space camp, by the way. But I wanted to be an astronaut too. See, see, so there it is again with the purpose, right? Like in your it, when I was young, I thought my purpose was to be a radiologist until I figured mm -hmm. out I actually don't like broken bones. Then I thought mm -hmm. my purpose was to be a doctor, and I I failed organic chemistry twice. So things popped up that yeah. were like, nope, no. Nope. So my question to you, Bree. Okay, let's put it this way. I have gone and studied to be a pilot, to be a chaplain, to be a clinical psychologist. I have painted houses. I have delivered people, <laughs> <laughs> right? I have done, um, I, I'm still going to be a race car driver. <laughs> right? and, and I do it every day. Uh, even though the cops, uh, you know, <laughs> they, they don't understand they, your they training, might, huh? They might, right. They're going to figure out that I'm out there <laughs> not training. Um, my question to you is why does your purpose have to be singular? I think it's because, and I'm, I'm just going to blame society on this, but it's because you feel like you have to be single track. Okay, I will mm -hmm. say as a as a woman, and I would love to hear if other women on this call feel the same way, but as a woman, if you have multiple purposes, or if you are like, oh, I'm I'm an, I'm going to be an artist in this moment and then I'm going to turn over here and I'm going to start cooking and then over here I'm I'm going to still, you know, do all this this business stuff. Pe people will literally call you a hot mess. And mm -hmm. so I feel mm -hmm. like if I have multiple purposes, they can that that's fine but they have to exist in a single lane otherwise um gonna look like a hot mess and no one wants to be that do you have multiple geniuses yes i do do you have multiple genetic strands uh that uh should i say of lineage of many great uh individuals uh, in your genetic line who did a whole lot of shit that might be interacting and coming out through your fingertips and through your, your mental faculty and getting a bunch of ideas, right? That, let's put it this way. Hmm. All right. Is Elon Musk a hot mess? Some would say. Okay. But does he give a damn? Because nope. he's got $300 billion. <laughs> yes. True. Okay. Okay. So are, do we care more about what we are doing for ourselves and those who we love, or do we care more about what we think 
others believe about us. Right? This life is yours alone. Mm. And this is why you have to befriend yourself and decide what you will live for. Now you, you're talking about detachment. And I don't know if anybody else is like feeling that like you have to actually detach from what people think about you what or, people, or yeah. okay or, or detach from what you think people think <sighs> or detach from what you believe you should think about yourself so detach from the perceptions ah. but okay this is my favorite part about being with you in this space what Okay, be that it is an inaccurate reference point, for some, it is a reference point nonetheless, yes. right? So, like, how do you just say, like, nah, I'm not gonna worry about that, right? <laughs> okay, <clears throat> let's put it this way. When I ask myself, what am I afraid of? Because as I wrote into, uh, dig deep the uh, chapter about fear. Fear sends us into the space of void, loss, grief. What are we afraid to lose? What is keeping you in that space? It's not a matter of what are we afraid to do, but what are we afraid not to do, right? Where did the fears come from? Are you keeping yourself from moving forward because you are simply afraid of the success you might achieve because sometimes people are or how difficult the path looks. These questions are the ones we have to ask ourselves. Ultimately, when I find myself doing 100 miles an hour on the highway and it's very easy to do and I have got to get to work, <laughs> in 90 minutes or less because I used to work in the Bay. <laughs> Let's see if that happens again, Dr. Bree. <laughs> <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Well, the cops might be up there. Yeah, okay. Well, you might get a ticket. Yeah, I might, I don't have one now. Okay. Well, you might crash. Well, I'm not crashing right now. Mm. Your children aren't in the car. The only thing I'm really afraid of is losing my children. They're not in the car. 100 miles an hour, here we go. Okay. Okay. I see. All right. I'm picking up what you're laying down. And I also love what John put in the chat, which is this. Let me see that. He says that he looks at what everyone else thinks is important. And then he goes to look for his purpose in the opposite direction, which I think <laughs> is just like, that's brilliant. Right? So I, I think that is what you're saying too, like everybody's saying all of these worries and yet you're like, yeah, those could be true. And yet here I am gonna go and go do my thing. And I think what happens a lot in life, at least from a parent perspective, and maybe this happens other places in life too, is you start to predict and you hear predictions of what might happen. And then that is what actually leads you or to change your behavior, right? I do that with my kids a lot. I'm like, you're gonna drop that. Mm -hmm. I just put a prediction on them that they're going to drop it, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of me saying like, hey, I'm scared. I'm scared right, that you right. might drop that, right? And your perception where yes. we're trying to live in a future that doesn't exist in a past that we can't go back to. Yes, yes, yes. I know that's what I'm doing. It's true. So I, I think that people have these conversations with themselves too, right? Like I think that people are like, oh, I might, I'm going to go for this job, but um, I might, I might not get it right? Or I probably won't make it to the second round. Or 
I'm gonna go for this, I don't know, I'm gonna try to date this person and they're probably not gonna like me. So like we put these predictions on ourselves and then we change the course of our behavior according to those predictions, but we're not actually naming like, I'm ashamed that I might not be liked mm -hmm. or I feel guilty that mm -hmm. I, you know what I'm, didn't you say? Or I'm afraid of repeating uh, the past or I'm stuck in the past. I can't move forward. All of these things that we are holding to ourselves for whatever particular reasons, mm -hmm. because we have yet to truly understand ourselves. Yeah. We are very intricate. We have been through a lot of shit. <sighs> say that one more time, just so we everybody have, in the back can hear you. We <laughs> are very intricate. And we have been through a lot of shit. Yeah. 2019, probably one of the, man, that was like the year zero. We all started. I, 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 I retired. I got remarried. <sighs> right. I, I made, made my way back to Cleveland. And then at the end, I got something that kind of felt like COVID. <laughs> And then I got all bubbly and I said, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> right. Going into 2020 and then I got reconstructive surgery. I said, oh Lord, what's happening? I feel like Frankenstein. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I'm not yep. the only one. Yep. Right. Yeah. Unexpected circumstances is, uh, uh, the, this is called life. And then we become afraid of more unexpected circumstances mm. and we don't know how to prepare for them. And then we slow down in believing that we can control the unexpected and we can control aspects of life that are essentially uncontrollable. Fair, yeah. We don't have control over anything other than the way that we think sometimes, <laughs> right? Because other people, you gotta take some medication. Like, oh, fuck, <sighs> running out. I got 30 days until I'm crazy again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let, I'm, I'm putting, I'm gonna put one, one more layer on this. Um, By the way, I can say that because I take medication. All right, I'm a disabled veteran. Okay. I'm speaking for myself, not for others. Okay, fair. Okay, all right. So what if you have been in an abusive relationship, an emotionally abusive relationship, and this idea of self-love has been brought up by your friends, by your family, you see it all the time. Oh, you just need to exercise self-love, self-love. But you have been bombarded with day after day after day that one, these perceptions of you are absolutely true. They are the absolute truth, right? You aren't good enough. You're not a good enough partner. You're not available enough. You're not all of these things that you're told day in and day out. Then you go to try to find self-love and you try to have this acceptance to reach reality, yeah. but it's so warped, right? Like your, your path to acceptance is so bumpy and it's full of potholes and all of this other stuff that you just end up not taking the road like how do you how do we do how do we do that when befriending ourselves we feel like that self is not worthy of being befriended i i get that um <clears throat> the uh divorce that i experienced uh was a part uh of needing to get away from what was being warped within me see yep and um be and also I ended up landing on a position of being a uh, domestic violence um, counseling and program manager, right? Mm. So learning the cycles of abuse and 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 uh, becoming a, a, a kind of a subject matter, uh, I, I can't say expert because um, I'm certainly not an expert, but I lived this stuff. So I, yeah. I, I held a group for men, most important, right? So um, I'm familiar with what you're speaking. So when it comes down to um, what you proposed, how do we uh, repair and how do we recreate ourselves? Mm -hmm. That is a very good question. How do we remove the false perception 
of others and get back to our true selves, true awareness. How do we get back to who we were prior to that individual? Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Well, the book doesn't answer it all. It doesn't solve it all, but there are affirming ways. There are repairing ways. There is a neurological process. Yes. Right? You are a supercomputer. And I need you all to affirm this. Within this book, there is um, subject matter that talks about quantum entanglement, right? Fuck all that language and just say the speed of thought. That's all quantum entanglement means. The speed of thought, which means that thought wave patterns travel faster than light. Okay. That's what they were. That's what they figured out, which means that in, even in the presence of light, darkness exists. You turn off the light, guess what? It's dark again. Okay. Light is actually a abnormality. It's superficial, which means that within darkness, all things exist. Now, I'm not talking about simply the um, uh, biblical idea of good and evil when you're talking about darkness. I'm talking about dark matter. I'm talking about um, the unseen um, aspect of the universe. In ancient times, they called it Amun. So we're talking about within ancient Egypt right? In other spiritual traditions, there were many different um, uh, names attributed to this um, source being existence. Logos, the word. Uh, again, I've, I've, I've gone through, if you will, monastic studies, traditions, masters of theology, blah, 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 blah whatever, right? <laughs> the point that I'm making is, if we're going to take it to a scientific level, we're talking about those things which are born from the immaterial to the material. You have light synapses called neurons in your brain. So what's happening is those neurons have a pattern. You can change that pattern into something different based upon how you reprogram your mind. Right? So how is this duplicated? I'm, I'm going to put this into a tangible form, uh, understanding, understanding form. At Microsoft, at Google, at IBM, they were doing this years ago. They have to take uh, hundreds of programmers to develop an algorithm. An algorithm is basically a, uh, uh, a DNA, RNA synchronizing process. If you look at an algorithm, it looks like a DNA strand only on the uh, digital um, uh, should I say overlay, it intertwines, it overlaps, it looks like a double helix. The more complex it gets, it continues to intertwine and overlap. So when they created the internet, oh, mind you, I was a computer information system specialist for the army, okay, <clears throat> whatever, okay, so, I did some of that shit too. <laughs> That's what I initially did for the uh, army. So I went into it and um, learned how, you know, the computer. So the computer was modeled after the human brain. Okay. You have a processor, you have a graphic user interface, um, you have memory, 
right? They named it after the human. And then they came up with something called the internet. But before it was called the internet, it was called the ethernet, which is why you have an ethernet cable. If you understand philosophy, Plato and Euclid and all of them, they learned from who? The ancient Egyptians, right? And they called the air up there, right? Or the spirit, espire, right? Ether. Hmm. Okay, all right. Let's see where we're going with this. So the ethernet then becomes a way to transfer light wave frequency from one host to another. So all they were doing was duplicating the human model and the mental model and grafting the computer and human process of thinking after one another. And then the Department of Defense after, uh, and DARPA, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, developed a way for these computers to talk to one another through light waves. And now it's through dark matter. You can't see it, right? Now, quantum computers, quantum mechanics is the ability for the computer to develop its own coding, its RNA, if you will, sequencing. So as it writes its own code, it learns by its self and thus grows, which is why Elon Musk said, this is the scariest shit he's ever seen. <laughs> because they're on some other stuff out there while trickling it down to what we're fooling around with 5G, <laughs> right? <sighs> and then they make space force like that's some new shit where all it is is a compartmentalization of all the space technologies uh, that they were uh, already um, uh, using and in production and working with and so then they say, boom, guess what? What y'all didn't know is that we already militarized space, but all this other shit, um, we're just gonna call it Space Force and here's what you got. So the point that I'm making is that you can reprogram your mind because they've already done that shit with computers. <laughs> problem is I don't have somebody that wrote a logarithm for me. That's my problem. You write algorithms for yourself every day and put on the daily a code <laughs> that's called RNA and then it becomes your DNA and then you pass it down to your children you're making computers quantum computers which is why they need human resources this befriending yourself I thought it was going to be like read a book fill out a worksheet now you're talking about I have to rewire my brain. <sighs> but you can consciously do it. All you need to do is create a mental model of who you want to be. And then you're like, oh shit, just tap into Skynet. Skynet is God. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. I feel like we need to do this again because like, first of all, we have to wrap it up in one minute, which just, that's unfortunate. I wish I could just spend a little bit more time with all of you guys. But I feel like too, that there was there's so much in this idea of rewiring your brain, which we only scratched upon on the surface, that has so much to do with emotional intelligence that I feel like we need to do this again. And I also feel like that's where people are really wanting to understand like what are good thoughts that's all great but when you go to sleep and the cleaning crew comes out and brushes away all the things that you didn't use for the day 
how do I know that I used it enough so that the cleaning crew won't come through? I'm the mom where like there's a little bit left of like the soda or like the water, pick it up and everyone's like, where's my water? I'm like, oh, you weren't done with that? I'm sorry. So I don't want the cleanup crew to come in and clean up some of the stuff that I'm working on so that I feel like I have to start all over again. So like next time when we do this, Marcus, write this down. Will you, <laughs> he's like, do, 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 do. Will right. you, um, will you share with us like, like some like, like, I don't know, like four ways that you can like strengthen your neurons so that the rewiring actually happens. Yes, I know it's going to take time. I know 60 something days, whatever. Okay, whatever it will take. But like, I can't be the only one that's really like struggling with this idea of like, I want to rewire my brain. I get it. I understand the science behind it. It all makes sense. But like my cleanup crew goes in there at night and just like, when I'm spick and span in the morning and I've forgotten all the work that I did. And then it's like, repeat, you have to repeat it. Oh, that's what it Persistent is. perseverance. You have to continue it. It's like, it's like a damn Tony the Tiger Frosted Flakes commercial. You might see it once, but you got to bring out the motherfucking tiger again, right? And bang on that table. Like, oh, Mark, I'm not seeing this commercial again? Marcus, you, you are not old enough to know about Tony the Tiger. <laughs> oh, all right. But yeah. I do have children. <laughs> So I'm. this is what I'm going to do. For those of you who don't know Tony the Tiger, I don't know how popular he is in other countries, but he's this giant cartoon tiger and he always talks about this cereal and he comes out, they're great. So now that you guys have a little image of it, maybe that's what you need to do in the mirror before you go to bed tonight so the cleanup crew doesn't come in. Just say, I'm great and see what happens. In the in the, greatness is in you. Oh, Marcus, Marcus, thank you so much. Like, thank you for doing this. Thank you for getting us started. Like, there's still more to do. So stay tuned for that. Um, if and you thank guys you. have um, Apple Books, uh, you can get Dig Deep um, from my website, MarcusBanksBay.com. Um, uh, Apple Books is the best way to read it. You can order it. It's actually discounted. Um, uh, it's $14.99. Uh, I know I was doing a whole bunch of reading. I've got like only like 10 copies uh, left to be able to send out. We're still working on getting it uh, onto Barnes and Noble and uh, being able to flesh it out to everybody. But just wanted to let you know it's digitally available. And when it hits the shelves and you guys want you guys want an autographed like copy you just you just find him on linkedin you, like, hey, where's still, my autograph? I, still owe you. I want i'm gonna drive out there and just hand deliver yours okay fair i appreciate that i appreciate that I mean, um the interview first in all seriousness i really appreciate all of you here to come to this space um as always it is really humbling when i see the same faces come and it's just like i just really appreciate you guys i really do appreciate you um and I will see you guys next month. Next month is going to be a good one too. They're always good. I need to come up with some other way to be like, I'm so excited. This is going to be so good. But we're going to dig a little bit deeper. Oh, you see what I did there, Marcus? Dig oh. deep. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we're going to dig deep into listening deeply uh, to people and and how that can turn into um, helping you with like researching different people but how it really starts with listening deeply and i don't think that that will be that far off from what we talk about today so i'm hoping that that all of these things are not just a random stream of consciousness but um have some sort of continuity so with that thank you marcus you're gonna be back so get used to all of these people on this screen oh, absolutely. Get used to us. I, I appreciate everybody who who showed up <laughs> and want to see them again Amazing. Well, thank you, everybody. Have a good morning, good night, good afternoon, wherever you may be. And as I always say, stand in your experience, and I will see you guys next time. Thank you. Peace.